We've been talking about what makes us, what makes our families, what is the identity. And so we're, we're coming this week to the idea of wisdom from God is what makes a God-centered family. What makes us different from the good family that lives next door? And what does that look like? And I encourage you to do some evaluation of your own life about where are you in this God-centered culture and how does that impact you? Because quite often, your culture is so close to you, you can't see it. For example, when you have a baby, you start feeding them with a spoon and then you rejoice when you can actually give them the spoon and they can begin to feed themselves. It's one of the rites of passage. Did you know that almost a third of people in the world eat with their hands? Uh, About a billion and a half people eat without fork, knife, spoon. And in both Cambodia and India, I was there and in India, we were at a conference, and all these guys were dressed up in suits and nice clothes, and we came down, and the big, big dish of food was brought out, and they just put their hands in, and they put it on their plate, and then they sit there very delicately, and you make a ball of it, and there's a, there's a whole art to it. But you and I would think of that as, that's weird. To them, they think it's weird what we do. In fact, one of them said to me, well, I know where my hands have been. You don't know where that fork has been. <laughs> Point well taken. And did you know almost another third of the world uses chopsticks to eat? But when your baby was learning to eat, you never handed them chopsticks. So what I'm saying is that quite often the culture that you've received and the culture that's around us, we just absorb it without asking the question, is this what God wants us to do as a family? Is this what God wants me to do as an individual? And so I'm encouraging you to do some evaluation because God not only was taking, is taking his people out of the culture they came from, he's not only bringing us into a relationship with himself, he's wanting to change our culture to be a Christ-following culture. And there's a, a great picture of that. And uh, how many of you know what this is? Anybody know what that is? There's four of them. That's called a masusa. If you're a Jewish home, you follow Deuteronomy 6 that says, and put your scriptures, put the word on your houses and on your gates. So they have a little box that has a couple of scriptures written in it and a little piece of paper. And a devout Jew goes out and they kiss that every time they go out the doorway. And I was thinking about it. When did God give them that directive? Well, they had been in Egypt, and they were slaves, and they were in an idol-worshiping culture, and they were in a we-don't-own-homes-we're-slaves kind of culture, and now God has them in the middle of the desert. You realize he told them to put these on their doorposts when they didn't have doorposts. They were living in tents. But what was he doing? He's saying, I'm taking you to a different place and you're going to be homeowners and you're going to be warriors and you're going to be my people and I want your word, the, my word to be a vital part of that. So what God does is when he gets a hold of us is he not only forgives our sins and gives us eternal life, he says, I want to take you out of the culture of the home you grew up in. I want to take you out of the post-Christian American culture and I want to create in you and in your family a Christ-centered culture God-honoring, God-following culture. And it doesn't happen overnight, does it? It's a long process, and God has to continually challenge us and train us. So we want to walk through, and let me do a little review of where we've been, the, the culture of our homes and examining and evaluating what is it that we need to focus on. And in Proverbs chapter 1, the author of Proverbs, Solomon, says... Listen, my son, to your father's instructions, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They're a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. And then he begins to go for chapters, telling his son, watch out for this danger, watch out for this danger. And particularly, he says, seek wisdom. It is more valuable than anything else. And so one of the things that I hope to do as we walk through a little review, and then as we walk through this idea of wisdom is raise that value of what is the wisdom quotient of my life? What's the wisdom quotient of our home? And make an intentional desire to make that your culture. So what is it that sets your culture? 
First of all, it's our beliefs and values. What, what underlies everything is what we believe about the world and what's important, and it sets the values of our home. And Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Where does wisdom come from? It comes from a healthy, deep respect that there's a God who created us and we're accountable to him. Fear doesn't mean I'm running away and in terror. It means I have a soberness about God. Do you think we've lost that as a culture, American culture? Yeah, we have. Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. We've gone back to Judges. But Proverbs says, if we are going to have a wise home, it starts with a deep understanding of God and who he is and what he wants. So, What does it mean to have God's wisdom? Well, let me give you a quick definition. It means seeing life from God's point of view. Not from your dad's point of view or from your mom's point of view or from your friend's point of view or from your own personal point of view. It means God wants to slowly transition us so that we begin to see everything as it appears to God, which is clearly what happens as we read the scripture if we're asking that question. And we talked about what are those beliefs and values in the past. And we we talked about that powerful word grace. That if you're a Christ-following individual or a Christ-following family, it means we know that we all have a sin problem. That there is sin in us and that's why confession to God and confession to each other should be a normal part of family life, not a rare occasion. And I told you that sometimes as parents, a good, honest apology may make more of an impact than a month of teaching. And uh, some of you have shared that. It also means we need the rescuing grace of Jesus every single day. Without the Spirit of God, you and I are dangerous. And you know what? The, The way in which a family can be destroyed is so much easier than the way in which a family can be wisely built. So it's a downward pressure, and we need Jesus. It also has to do with what we elevate And we've used this idea of elevate and tolerate. And what are the things that you elevate in your home? And we've talked about this idea that your home is the starter for your kids as they grow up. And Proverbs 22 says, start children off in the way that they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Now, that's not a promise that says if you take them to Sunday school, they will always be followers of Jesus. That is a pattern and a probability that says, Parents, our responsibility is to start them off in the way that they should go, to create in them a Christ-following, wisdom-seeking culture. And then you have to, you work like it all depends on you and you pray like it all depends on God because there are lots of things that you have little or no control over. So it says we're going to elevate. And how do you elevate things in your home? Well, I want you to think through what are the rituals that you do in your home? You say, well, we really don't have rituals. Oh, yeah? What do you do at Thanksgiving? What do you do at Christmas? What do you do on Super Bowl Sunday? What do you do when you take kids to school? And some of the best practices, there's been some great rituals. Because I believe that healthy families have healthy rituals. And that part of the process is that we begin to change how we operate weekly, I mean daily, first of all. How do you do when you get up in the morning? Does God have a part of that? How do you do when your, your kids are at the dinner table and your grandkids are there? How, what are the rituals that you do that, that point them towards Christ? What do you do weekly? How vital is it for you to be involved in a church community and in connection with other believers? How, how important are those daily things? And I, I even encourage couples who are often working on their marriage to start taking walks together. Because last week, Pastor Will said, men often talk better shoulder to shoulder than they do face to face. And sometimes in walking together, things come out. They just came up. Well, what happens is you, sp- you spend that time, and you can't force that to happen, but you can create the environment in which it can happen. So the rituals that you have, the celebrations, how do you make somebody feel special when they have uh, something notable that happens? And listen, what things do you celebrate? Do you celebrate that they've learned a bunch of Bible verses or do you celebrate that they scored a soccer goal? Well, well, you are saying in everything that we celebrate, this is a big deal. And that's how we elevate things. And then what are the heroes that you lift up? We just had the Harvest Festival and so many kids came dressed up as superheroes and kids are so fascinated with heroes. Now let me ask you, is it a different girl 
who thinks Princess Elsa is the whole way that you should be, or think Princess Esther, Queen Esther, who saved her country by sacrifice. Is that a different, if that becomes your hero, instead of, for example, somebody who gets bit by a poisonous spider and now can sling webs? That's probably not going to be in their future. But Daniel in the lion's den could be in their future. And you start thinking, what stories are we telling? What, what stories are we reading to them? What are we elevating? And when our kids were little, we read them the, a whole thing of Pilgrim's Progress and a children's version. And that paints those pictures of who are, who are our important and what are those qualities that we want to lift up. So we need to intentionally choose the heroes that we emphasize. And then, of course, there is what you tolerate in your home. What are the things that we say, we have rules about these? And most homes have sort of semi-written rules or stated rules, and then there's a whole bunch of unwritten rules. And mom says that I was kind of a pain to her when I was a kid because she would explain and she would talk about sin. And my mom's death on sin, let me tell you. So if something was sin, it's like, we don't do that. Well, then I would say something incorrectly, and she'd say, we don't do that. And I said, is it sin? <laughs> no, that's just bad grammar. Okay, then we were throwing baseballs in the house. We don't do that. Why? Is that sin? Well, maybe, if your mom's told you already. But, but you see, kids test those boundaries, and you know what? Most parents haven't really thought through why they have the rules they have. And so you need to say, is this an intentional focus on wisdom, or am I just trying to keep them from being annoying to me? And the latter is probably where our unwritten rules come from. Like, what do you do when dad's watching football? Who gets the remote control? You know, there's lots of unwritten rules in your homes. And let me tell you, kids pick them up quickly. And then, of course, as we look at what is in our home, we talked last week about language. So we've talked about our beliefs, we've talked about what we elevate, what we don't, don't tolerate or do tolerate, and then we talked about our language, and, and Pastor Will and Zach walked through the fact that the language of the kingdom of God is truth in love. And if you're all truth and no love, then you're in this critical truth-telling, I'm going to let you know what's wrong with you. If you're all love and no truth, then you're fearful and enabling and you don't have those conversations. And if we move up to where we are challenging and discipling our children and discipling each other, it means you have conversations where you need to talk about hard things, but you do it with compassion and care and love. And this week you were challenged to have a truth in love conversation. And I hope you did that. If not, we'll give you one week extension. Because this is a vital part of how we talk about things and how we talk. And the sad thing is we often talk to other people negatively about our family without ever talking to them about it. And we don't do it in love. So those are some of the factors that make up the culture of your home. And our, our goal in this series has been to help you examine how is your individual life, how is your marriage if you're married, how is your pouring into your children if you're a parent? How is your grandparenting? Or even as we talked about the Apostle Paul, how is it that you're pouring into other people's children as a part of the church family? And how do we do that so that we are promoting God's wisdom? So I want to give you some categories because my goal is that we would lift up not only God's word, but I want to lift up the book of Proverbs to you this weekend. And there was a, several periods of my life when I've gone through reading one proverb a day. There's 31 proverbs, there's many months that are 31 days, and you can just read a proverb a day. And it begins to distill in you the things that make for very practical, wisdom-filled life. So I want to elevate some specific kinds of wisdom, and I'm going to give you four categories of wisdom that need to be in your life and in your home in ever-increasing measures no matter where you are in, the state, in your stage of life. And the first part, obviously, that makes a Christ-following family is that we need to have spiritual wisdom in our homes. That things need to come out, again, of those beliefs and values, need to come out of our life is God-centered, God-oriented, God-influenced. And so let me ask you a very simple determining question. What role does the Word of God have in your daily life? 
Is it something that you seek God's wisdom regularly? Is it something that you pour into children if you have them in your home? Is it, is it something that informs your friendships and relationships? Because God's wisdom comes from God's spirit and God's word. And Proverbs 2 says, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He's a shield to those whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just, and he protects the way of his faithful ones. I want you to see that God is the source of wisdom. Where does it come from? It sometimes comes from God through other people, but he's saying, if you want to be a wise person, you need to begin to see God not as a rule maker, not as just somebody who bails you out when you're in in trouble, but God is the one who can give you wisdom for whatever situation is in your life. And I'll tell you, God wants to give you wisdom more than you want it. And so we often think, well, I wish I knew what to do here. I knew what, I need help here. I need, I'm struggling here. And we need to come back and begin to see God as the source of wisdom and seek him and say, God, you're the one I go to when I am struggling, when I don't know what to do. I'm coming to you and I'm coming to your word. So, and then it goes on and all the way through Proverbs, he talks about how God gives success, how he shields, how he guards, how he takes care of, how, how God is an active participant. And my question to you is, do you think you're seeking God's wisdom or do you think you've arrived and you know enough by yourself? And, and I don't think we would say that, but I think we often live like that. I'm fine. I've got this. I have experience. I know what to do. And God's thinking, man, I used to tell my kids, everybody runs into brick walls. Some of them get wiser. Some of them just get lumpier. (laughs) And if you're really wise, you can watch other people run into brick walls. (laughs) And you don't have to do it yourself. So God's desire is to give us that wisdom. And there are many ways in which that gets challenged and channeled if you are parenting or grandparenting. And I want to take just a couple of minutes to talk about something that I think we need to talk about occasionally that we haven't talked about for a while. And that is one of the important decisions of a home, if you have children in the home or if you're a parent, a grandparent influencing them, is what are your school choices that you make? And there are three primary options, and this can be an emotional subject, so I step into this carefully. Homeschooling, Christian schooling, public schooling, or some combination of those. And here's what I believe you need to understand. Every option has some advantages and some disadvantages. There's some potential and some pitfalls no matter what choice you make. And quite often, I find that within the Christian community, people kind of camp on their particular type and tend to look down on people who don't agree. So every family who chooses homeschooling, there are some wonderful possibilities. You can use the scripture, you can control the content, you can pour into your kids. It's often not as expensive as Christian school, and and you can really make a difference in terms of being a close-knit family. Are there some downsides to homeschooling? Well, there certainly can be. It's very, very time-intensive, And sometimes when your kids get into high school, they know more than you do, and that gets to be a challenge when you're trying to teach them geometry and you've never been past Algebra 1. But but some of the difficulties I find also is sometimes they don't know how to relate to unbelievers. They don't have a clear way of having other connections. And sometimes they, they have actually, I've seen in homeschool kids, they've developed a critical superiority. Can you see they did that and they did that and and they understand the difference between sin and righteousness but they often have a real critical looking down their nose on people that are not followers of Jesus and who are living sinful lifestyles. The Christian school has some wonderful advantages. You've got some expert teachers, you've got curriculum, you've got some sports, you've got an ability to have your kids interacting with other Christian kids and there's some wonderful advantages to that but there's some downsides, it's expensive. Usually it involves a whole lot of extra of your time as well, which is, can be a very good thing. But I find that sometimes kids that go to Christian school, and I told this, Will said, give them this quote you gave me years ago, back when he was a Christian school teacher. And I told him the concern I have is that Christian schools often turn out nice kids, but they rarely turn out passionate kids. They go to chapel all week long, 
Quite often they say, I don't want to go to church on the weekend. I've already been to church all week long. And by the time they get out of high school, and, and Will actually did some calling through some of his kids that were in his classes, a very small percentage of them choose to make church a part of their young adult life. Because they feel like, I've done my Christian thing. I'm done with that. That was my parents' choice. That wasn't my choice. And so sometimes they become very enculturated in the Christian school, but they've not made a personal, passionate decision for Christ. And then the public school, there's some advantages with cost and with the programs that are offered, especially for special needs kids. And there's all kinds of great ways in which we can interact with other parents and your kids can learn to interact. But boy, let me tell you, the the stuff coming out of our government and the stuff coming into the schools is even more toxic than it was 10 and 20 years ago. And so if you've got your kids in public schools, you need to understand that you need to be on your connection with those teachers and connection with your kids and knowing what they're going through and facing. And the sad thing is I see some Christian parents just send their kids to, Christian, to public school and they don't pay attention to what they're getting filled with. And the, in, the peer pressure is incredibly intense. And I remember we were, the kids were in junior high and they sent a notice home that said we're going to be doing sex ed in health class. Here's the film we're going to show. Come preview it, which I greatly appreciated. And you know the bad side of it? We were the only parents there previewing that film. Why? Because they were just giving their kids to the public school system and not paying attention. So here's what I would challenge you as your pastor. If you have children and you're making this decision, make your decision prayerfully for every kid every year. Know the systems, the advantages and disadvantages. Know what your children are going through and how they're doing and prayerfully consider what your culture of your family is going to be. But don't make one decision and think it's going to go for the next 12 years. Be wise in every time reevaluating and saying, for our family, for our kids, what is the best? It is important that you pay attention to what it is that your children are getting influenced by in terms of their spiritual wisdom. And if you're doing that, if you're putting them in any of the systems, you need to counterbalance whatever the disadvantages are. And you need to do that intentionally. In my home, there was a catalytic moment We'd moved from a little town in Utah where there were 18 kids in the graduating class. And we, we moved out to Coos Bay where I was going to Marshfield at its heyday. And there were 600 kids per class. There were over 2,500 kids in the school. And we came into the little church there and the pastor before, the, that was there before we were took my dad aside and he said, everything I was afraid would happen to my son when I sent him to Marshfield happened. And the son had gotten into drugs and he'd led the youth group in rebellion against his dad and they had lasted less than a year and a half and they were moving out. And so can you imagine as a parent taking your kids into that scenario and saying, now I'm going to send my sophomore son who's been used to a tiny little school and now he's going into this maelstrom of Marshfield. And I remember my dad sat down and we had a family meeting at our house and he said to us, this is not a one missionary family, this is a seven missionary family. And if you are not interested in reaching for Christ, the kids at your age level, my ministry will go nowhere because we have to be in this together. And you know that, that God began to work in us. And as we got involved in the youth group, in a little church of 100 to 120, we had a youth group of 35 that met on Tuesday nights. And kids got saved and we learned to do, le my leadership training came in that youth group. And it was a challenging scenario. And it's easy to retreat in fear. Instead of saying, by God's grace, we are going to take territory from the enemy. We're going to disciple our children. We're going to pour into them. We want them not only to accept Jesus, we want to train them to be passionate and and be able to be an influencer of the world instead of being influenced by the world. We, if we're going to have a Christ-centered, spiritually wise home, we are going to have to be intentionally counterculture because the culture we live in is becoming more and more godless. And the answer is not, 
to try to go out there and change all the unbelievers, the answer is that our homes need to be discipleship centers where we are raising young people who are going to impact the world. That we need to be impacting it at the adult level and our children can impact it at the youth level. We need spiritual wisdom in our home more than we have. We also need marriage wisdom. One of the places where Satan is destroying homes is in how marriages are formed and how marriages are dissolved. And I just met somebody yesterday and I didn't realize that both of these people had been married to other people and now they were divorced and now they're married to each other and all that's happened in a period of about two years. And, and that is the story of our generation. That's what's happening. So how do we have Christ-centered homes where marriage is done well, not only at the beginning, but where we warn our children and prepare them and give them everything that they need to have a great marriage and how do we as married couples have a great marriage that continues to be an example to our children. So what does he say to his son when he's talking through? The the author of Proverbs says, purity is a critically important factor. You talk about being countercultural. This is counter to our culture. And he says to his son, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. He's saying, can I give you a piece of advice? For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. He says, you're going to go out into the world, son, and there are going to be women out there who will tell you everything you want to hear. They will flatter you. They will build you up. They will be so attractive. And then he says, And in the end, she's bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. (laughs) Sweetie, she may look hot on the outside, but if you want to kill yourself, there you go. And this isn't about women. This was a father talking to a son. If it was a mom talking to her daughter, she would say, there's a guy I want to tell you about. And I was teasing somebody who had a little bit of a... uh, proclivity towards dating bad boys and I say if you date bad boys you will marry a bad husband and that's the truth isn't it so how do we need to prepare well he talks about the fact that there needs to be purity before marriage and the setting of a relationship that's built on godly wisdom and on connection of character and connection of your whole life And I will tell you frankly it's not young people who are getting involved in immorality it's every age group And he calls us, first of all, to be pure, to say God has given us this beautiful gift of sexuality, and it is to be between a husband and a wife only in the context of a covenantal marriage. That's where it belongs. So sometimes we talk about the purity side. We also need to talk about the passion side of it, that godly marriages should be filled not with, okay, we're getting along as sort of civil roommates, but that God's call to us is to have a passionate love for each other, to be building that. I was talking to a a younger couple and they were having really struggles in their marriage and they were were thinking about breaking up or staying together. And she said, said, I never want to be like his parents. They've stayed together, but it is not good. You realize that we're influencing the next generation by what they see in us. Is, it, is a marriage possible that lasts? You see, not, not only do we need to have the purity before marriage, we need to have that passion within marriage. I remember saying to one of my daughters who didn't always wear her clothes around the house, you can either say, shame on you, get dressed, I don't believe that you do that, and convey to them that sex is dirty and to be, to be thought of as shameful and your bodies are to be thought of as shameful. And we would say to her, honey, your husband's really going to love that someday. <laughs> Could you put some clothes on right now, though? You see, it's how you give the messages, what you say. Because he goes on, the father says, may your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. How how many parents would say that to their kids? You see, sadly enough, the joke is if you want to quit having sex, get married. And then the worst joke is if it's a marriage that's Christian marriage, we quit having sex. And what he says is, oh no, 
the, the forecast I have for you is it to be a delightful place where you're rejoicing in each other and there's a, there's a love, passion. That's what God's plan is for you. And if godly marriages are not exhibiting the kind of intensity of passion, then what kind of example do kids have when they're growing up? And, and I sadly say that often when I do pre-marriage counseling, I say, what did your parents tell you about sexuality? And it's like, Pfft. Where did you learn about it? In the locker room? On the internet? Because sometimes thinking we focus on purity means we are being unable to talk about what it is that God talks about. We don't even want to read this verse. But God does. He puts it in there, doesn't he? So we need marriage wisdom. What else do we need? We need character wisdom. And character wisdom means that development of those character qualities. And if you look through the book of Proverbs this week, as I'm going to take you through in the devotions, he talks about integrity, telling the truth. He talks about forming good friendships. He talks about having compassion on those that are oppressed or needy. And all the way through the scripture, you see this desire, not only that we be just Christ followers, but that we be the kind of character that draws people to think, I don't know what they got, but I want some of that. Wouldn't it be cool if everybody had integrity and developed wise friendships and had compassion? And then the last category, as he talks about, is we need financial wisdom. And and I was thinking as I was preparing this message, I was just reading through Proverbs and, and thinking that spiritual wisdom and marriage wisdom and character wisdom and financial wisdom and and how those influence every part of your life how you choose to spend your time, what words you use, how you deal with your sexual life, how you deal with your finances. Those determine the course and the impact of your life. And so the book of Proverbs gives us very, very practical things. He he goes through and he talks about hard work and laziness and slothfulness. Where do kids learn to work hard? They'll either learn it or not learn it in their home setup, in their chores. He talks about saving and spending. He talks about being careful. And if you've been through Financial Peace University, you, you know the devastating impact that debt is having on our culture. And so many people are, I mean, obviously you can get there through medical needs and other things, but, but for so many, it's about buying stuff we can't afford and putting it on time and getting further and further and further into debt. And it begins to dissolve all of the resources that we have. And so there's warnings about that, warnings in there and, and promises. And then there's also the encouragement of generosity. That we as a, as a church family, we as godly people, we need to then understand that our wisdom, you know, our finances are not to be hoarded simply for ourselves. That God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. And we started that with our kids very early. Here's your dollar. A dime goes for God, a dime goes into savings, and let's talk about how you spend the rest. How do they learn how to deal with money? Let me tell you, that's an important and sometimes toxic influence in our lives. And so he gives us those challenges, and he says, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. He who gathers crops in the summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during the harvest is a disgraceful son. Let me tell you the categories, and these are important parts that we learn The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. We live in a gulp theirs down culture, don't we? And you know, we we every month we put a giving envelope into our program. And the challenge is not only for you to, to in worship say, God, the first part of what you've given to me comes back to you. But I hope that you understand that God desires us to be a generous people. That he wants us not to be just resourceful and storing it all up for ourselves, but to be giving freely. In fact, freely you have received, freely give is a scriptural principle. And I don't know where you are in this family stage. Maybe you're an individual thinking about marriage, maybe not thinking about marriage. Maybe you're parenting or maybe you're feeling regretful for the parenting you didn't get a chance to do. And I, I had a moment when I took one of my daughters off to college and she was going to a Bible school or Christian school. And as I drove her to this school, I thought of all the things that I wished that I had told her. And I tried to catch up, but it was only a two-hour drive. (laughs) 
that I was impacted with, how many things I have learned. And I'm a Bible teacher, and there were so many things I hadn't taught her. And I think almost every parent probably feels some of that. But my encouragement to you, if you're a parent, is be intentional about the culture of your home. Make wisdom a center point. And if you're a grandparent, (laughs) maybe you get to go back and try to do some things you missed on the first round. To be a source of compassion and connection, but mostly a source of God-centered wisdom. That our homes would be full of it and that our children would grow up filled with God's wisdom and a passion for his work. And wherever you are, I hope that that's true of you. I want to dismiss now to the South Umpqua campus and to the Green campus. Love you guys. Walk through here this. Let me give you a couple of specific challenges. We put the devotions in every week, and I know that quite often you have your own devotional you're working through, and I would just like to encourage you once in a while, if you don't regularly do it, read through the devotions that are on here. And what I did this week is I walk you through a bunch of the Proverbs. And I want you to do that, I'm seeking wisdom, God, because even this morning when we talked, there, there were all kinds of things we talked about. And my concern is that when I tell you many things, you get nothing. So what I want you to do is to say, God, what is it you're speaking to me right now? Of all those things that were shared, what is it that God's saying, that one was for you? And that you grab onto that and that you take it home. And as you read through the devotional this week, let that be something that reinforces what it is that God's trying to build in you. And then secondarily, in your family, I encourage you to talk about what's the wisdom that you most need? Is it spiritual wisdom? Is it marriage wisdom? Is it that character wisdom? Is it financial wisdom? And that you begin to pray and say, God, give me your wisdom because I do not have enough wisdom to handle the complexities and the difficulties of my life and of my culture. And I hope you haven't got the idea that you think you've had enough and you're done, but that God still needs to pour a whole bunch more into you and that you let him do that. Because as I said, <laughs> He wants you to do, give you more wisdom than you're interested in. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your love to us and the way that you lovingly take us out of the culture that we grew up in and you begin to pour into us the culture of spiritual wisdom. And God, help us to address the ways in our family in which we have a tendency to watch too much TV and to be focused on things that don't matter and don't last. And Father, by your grace, would you give us your wisdom that our conversations, that our culture, that our things that we elevate, the things that we tolerate, that they would be based on your scriptures and your word and your wisdom. And God, all of us need that, mostly more than we know. So we ask humbly for your wisdom, and we want to receive it today and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.